next on Unsolved Mysteries. On a North Carolina highway, four young men are stalked in a savage high-speed chase. What was the motive for this vicious hit-and-run killing? A forklift crushes the prime suspect and a young woman's disappearance. Was it an accident, suicide, or murder? Nazi leader Rudolf Hess was captured after his plane crashed in Scotland. Or was he? Some experts believe this man was an imposter. And a seven-year-old who has only hours to live is visited by a mysterious boy who seems to bring him back to life. Five stories of crime, deceit, and intrigue. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Join us. Rapid City, South Dakota. Tom Keeter is a forklift driver at a wood processing plant on the outskirts of town. Just after the morning shift change, his co-workers notice something is wrong. When they reach Tom, they find his head has been crushed beneath the wheels of his forklift. Hurry up, go get the foreman. Tom was 29 when he died he is survived by his wife, Nancy, and two children. Those are the facts that everyone can agree on. But the cause of his death is still a mystery. Tom's family believes that he was murdered. But the police have a very different theory. Their investigation concluded that Tom loaded the forklift, set it in motion, and then laid down in front of it. But why would Tom kill himself? Police believe that his death may be connected to the mysterious disappearance four days earlier of a woman named Tina Marcotte. Connection or coincidence? Well, nobody knows for sure. Tom Keeter and Tina Marcotte were casual friends who once worked for the same company. But one turned up missing and the other turned up dead. Tina Marcotte worked a late shift on Thursday at Black Hills Moldy. Shortly after midnight, she phoned her best friend, Vicki Riddle. I was already asleep and the phone rang and she was very upset. Hello? Vicki, my tire is flat. It's flat. Who is this? It's Tina. Look, I just finished my shift and now my tire is so flat that I can't even drive on it. Just give me a few minutes to get dressed and then I'll be right there. Um, you know what? Hold on just a second. Somebody just pulled up. Let me go see who this is, okay? Okay, but be careful. So I waited, and she went and talked to whoever it was. Hey, you don't have to come. Tom's here, and he's going to give me a ride home. Tom who? You know, Tom. He used to work here. I'll, I'll talk to you later. It was the last time anyone spoke to Tina. Initially, no one even reported her missing. Patrick Gleason, Tina's live-in boyfriend of 11 years and the father of her three children, thought that she would soon return. On Saturday morning, Patrick and Tom showed up at Vicky's house. According to Vicky, Tom became defensive when she mentioned Tina's last phone call. Or as I know, you're the only Tom that used to work with her. Tom tried to say I was drunk and went, no Tom from Ron. And then I said, well, she said Tom, the one that used to work here. And then we started talking about that. And Tom finally admitted that he was the only Tom that he ever knew that worked there. So he was just glaring at me and not acting himself. Patrick listened patiently and then asked Tom 
the obvious question. Tom, just be straight with me. You messing around with my old lady? No, man, you know me better than that. That right there didn't seem right to me because the way Tom was, if you tried to blame him for something that he didn't have anything to do with, with it, he would have started fighting with me. That's the type of person he was. Patrick and Tom went together to report Tina, Tina missing. But when the police went to check on Tina's car, they discovered that the tire had been slashed with a knife. Thursday. It suggested foul play. Black Hills Molden. After you uh, dropped your friend off following the softball game. My car broke down on the way home. Tom Cooter was asked to come in, and he voluntarily came in to give his story. Uh, he denied giving Tina a ride anywhere or even being out there. He stated that he had been at a softball game. He had given a, a friend a ride home, and his car had broken down. And he had spent approximately three or four hours fixing his car under a streetlight. But Tom never called his wife to say that he'd been delayed. He finally got home at around 3.30 in the morning. Where were you? The car broke down. Tom's wife, Nancy, told us that when Tom got home that night, that he immediately washed his clothes, which would have included his softball uniform as well as his shoelaces. And that led us to believe that that was a suspicious behavior. Three days after Tina disappeared, the police interviewed Tom at the lumberyard. We found a suspicious stain in your car. Oh, man. The next morning, Tom Keeter was dead. You gotta call somebody. Hurry up, go call the foreman. In my opinion, Tom Cooter took his own life in an attempt to make it look like an accident in order for his family to receive some sort of benefits. I believe that Tom was very overwhelmed as to what was taking place and he needed a way out. Tom's wife, Nancy, disagrees. Tom wouldn't do that. He wouldn't leave me and the kids. He, he would not do that. I, I won't ever believe that. Nancy is convinced that someone attacked Tom in the lumberyard and then crushed him under his own forklift. I believe he was murdered. I just wish the, the police would investigate this more instead of closing um, my husband's case, because there, there are leads in this case, um, and I don't believe they followed up on him. There were no drag marks to indicate that anybody had, had drug him. He weighed approximately 200 pounds. It would have been difficult to carry him. And there was no signs of a struggle in the area. So in my opinion, that I don't, I don't believe the, the murder theory. But the police do believe that Tom murdered Tina Marcotte. They think that on the night Tina disappeared, Tom showed up outside of her office. I believe that Tina's tire was intentionally slashed in order to keep her from leaving the place. I, I don't believe that Tom's appearance out there at 12.30 was coincidence. I think that was planned. It's Tina. Look, I just finished my shift, and now my tire is so flat that I can't I think Tom was out there waiting for her when she got off of work. The only thing that really failed in the whole plan was that she was on the phone when he drove up. Great, thanks. According to the police theory, Tom made sexual advances towards Tina. When he was rejected, he became enraged and killed her. So what are you doing over here? They have no evidence or anything to leak Tom into Tina's disappearance. They have nothing. Update. There are new developments in this case. Here's one of our staff with details. Four and a half years after Tom Keeter's death, his wife finally received insurance death benefits. A judge ruled there was not enough evidence to prove that Tom had committed suicide. 16 months after Tina Marcotte disappeared, her body was found under a wood pile at Tom's workplace. She had been hit on the head with a blunt object. Detectives continued to investigate this case for the next eight years. They now consider the case closed. Up next, Adolf Hitler's second in command spent 40 years in a prison, but some say that he was an imposter.
1933, Adolf Hitler seizes total power in Germany. By his side is his closest confidant, Deputy Reichsfuhrer Rudolf Hess. Today, Hess is at the center of one of the most remarkable mysteries of World War II. Rudolf Hess is in Britain. The story begins with this shocking 1941 newsreel. The world is astounded to learn that Rudolf Hess has been captured in Scotland while trying to deliver a secret peace proposal to contacts in the British government. After the war, Hess is returned to Germany and sentenced to life in prison for war crimes. To imprisonment for life. And then, 40 years later, he is found dead in the prison garden. Though his death is officially declared a suicide, his family and some experts are convinced that he was murdered. I have no sympathy for the Nazi past or any crimes that Hess may have committed, but he was a human being, and he deserves the dignity, at least, to find out if he was murdered, who did it? The Hess affair is a tangle of accusations and rumors. Was the man in prison for 40 years truly an imposter? And if he was murdered, who had a motive? The answers may reveal a conspiracy at the highest levels of the British government. The man called Rudolf Hess was incarcerated in Berlin Spandau prison from 1947 until his death in 1987. He was a loner and made no friends. In 1973, British surgeon Hugh Thomas did a full physical examination of Hess. He expected to find scars from the severe bullet wounds that Hess had received in the First World War. There were no scars, no bullet wounds, nor was there any evidence of an operation. They're not things that you can miss. So I'm left with a situation whereby a man has total evidence in surgical terms of no wounding and total evidence in documentary terms of such wounding. It can't be the same man. If the man Dr. Thomas examined at Spandau was not Rudolf Hess, then who was he? The answer may lie in a series of events that took place in May of 1941. On May 10th, Rudolf Hess told his wife that he planned to fly to Berlin for a critical meeting. Records show that he took off the same day in a Messerschmitt plane marked NJC-11. He was tracked by German radar and defense controllers right across Germany and across occupied Europe. And just after half past seven that evening, was lost to German radar going north over the North Sea. Four and a half hours after Rudolf Hess left Germany, a lone Messerschmitt was picked up on British radar, heading towards Scotland. That evening, a Scottish farmer caught sight of a plane about to crash. Right, pal, hands up. The pilot said his name was Alfred Horn. He asked for a meeting with the Duke of Hamilton, a member of the British Parliament who lived in the area. Surprisingly, the man carried no identification, but he was wearing the uniform of a Luftwaffe officer. The next morning, a meeting was arranged with the Duke of Hamilton, then an officer in the Royal Air Force. As you were, gentlemen. Hamilton had met Hess briefly years before, and he was convinced that this man was Hess. But some historians disagree. They believe that Hitler and other members of the Nazi elite used doubles for security reasons, and that a double was used to impersonate Hess on the flight to Scotland. 
photographs taken upon Hess's departure support this theory. They appear to show a different plane from the one that crash landed in Scotland. The plane that took off in Germany was marked NJC-11. The plane that landed in Scotland was marked on the side of the fuselage VJ or NJOQ, a totally different plane. British researchers know that that aircraft was based at a, a fighter airfield in northern Denmark called Alborg. It was tracked in from that direction, and there really seems no reason to, to doubt that it came from Denmark rather than Germany. And there is more evidence that the real Hess was replaced by a double. The real Rudolf Hess was a skilled pilot. Yet the man who flew to Scotland made many basic mistakes. The man who approached Britain and flew over Scotland was an amateur in every sense of the word. He did everything wrong. He approached the British coast at the ideal height to be intercepted by radar instead of under it. Then he power dived using far too much fuel and then he flew at only 50 feet across the Scottish borders. Now that meant that uh, people on the ground could observe the aircraft and track it every step of the way. But the pilot was too low to even pick up his landmarks. So whoever he was, he was an amateur pilot. If the man who landed in Scotland was a double, how and why was this deception engineered? Next, a possible murder to keep the Hess cover-up a secret, and a conspiracy that could go to the highest levels of government. During World War II, a man claiming to be Nazi leader Rudolf Hess was captured in Scotland. He died in prison 46 years later. Yet many now doubt that the man was really Rudolf Hess. Was he a body double? And if so, why? From the beginning, Rudolf Hess was Hitler's closest confidant. But by the beginning of World War II, others were competing for Hitler's attention. Hess's biggest rival was the head of the dreaded SS, Heinrich Himmler. Hess had come to power purely by being one of the first of Hitler's loyal supporters. In such a position, he was obviously a threat to Himmler, who aspired to gain control of all of the Reich. So, in essence, he was part of a power struggle. And from that point of view, he was hated. Mein Führer. Yes, in early 1941, Hitler's inner circle, including Himmler, was planning the invasion of the Soviet Union. Hess argued that Germany should make a secret peace with England before this attack. But Himmler may have been a step ahead of him. Himmler may have recruited a body double for Hess and waited for a chance to replace him. And he used this double to actually supplant Hess, get rid of Hess, kill off Hess, and put the double into England to contain, to carry over peace proposals to the English hierarchy. According to this theory, if the double's mission had been successful, Himmler would have stepped in, finished the negotiations, and taken the credit. But the plan didn't work. Churchill refused to meet with Hess, and the peace proposal was rejected. Despondent, Hess attempted suicide a few days later. And then he claimed amnesia and refused to answer any questions from investigators and psychiatrists. Rudolf Hess. When the war ended, Hess was brought home to Germany for the Nuremberg trials. At the time, two of Hess's former secretaries were brought in to meet with him. Officials hoped to jog his memory. Kentuck Crawling, Connecticut Fall. Aaron, from Fiaran? 
Damen, ich nicht erinnern. The prisoner's most significant lack of recognition is that of his secretaries. That is their son. One of them showed him a picture of his son, whom he didn't recognize. Yet he'd carried a picture of that son with him, uh, supposedly, on his flight to England. So, the man was behaving in a very bizarre fashion. The two secretaries left upset, but were still sure that the man they had met was Rudolf Hess. Hess was sentenced to life imprisonment in a converted fortress in West Berlin. His new home was to be jointly administered by the United States, Britain, France, and the Soviet Union. One by one, Spandau's six other Nazi prisoners died or were released. But Rudolf Hess had his freedom blocked by a Soviet veto. For the last 11 years of his life, he was Spandau's only prisoner at a cost of over $1 million per year. Rudolf Hess loved to walk in the garden, this long trail, about 267 paces around. For the first two years in my talking with Hess, I never got beyond food, health, and weather. He lived in this eggshell. Time seemed to have stood still for him since 1941, since his flight. And though Hess was in prison in his native Germany, he refused all visits from his wife and son for the first 28 years. The reason why he didn't accept visits beforehand was simply that the surrounding and the circumstances under which these visits take place in Spandau were so bad that uh, he said uh, it's better not to see each other and to write. And after having paid these visits, uh, after 1969, I can only completely agree with him. In December 1969, he finally agreed to meet with his family. During this reunion, they were not allowed to touch one another or to discuss the past. Despite the fact that she felt his voice was lower in pitch, Frau Hess still felt that the man at Spandau was her husband. I have the impression that my father uh, was keeping some secret which he was not able to relieve to anybody. And this is the reason why he was kept so long in prison and finally was murdered in prison. Hess lived to the age of 93. On the day he died, he went out as usual for his daily walk. He was accompanied by an American guard. But according to the official record, the guard became distracted. Several minutes later, he went looking for his prisoner. He found Hess lying on the floor of a garden shed with a thick electrical cord wrapped around his neck. The official inquiry declared that Rudolf Hess had committed suicide, but almost immediately charges surfaced that Hess had been murdered. Now there are so many things against him committing suicide. He could hardly open his hands because of arthritis that he was suffering under. He's going to have to raise those hands, isn't he, above his head to put that cord around something to hang himself. He wasn't capable of doing that. I think he was murdered. Disturbingly, the cable that was actually used to murder him was the first thing to be destroyed on the specific orders of the British military governor. And the British military governor also ordered the shed burnt down. As well as that, they refused all measures of identification of the prisoner. The Hess family insisted on another autopsy and hired Dr. Wolfgang Spahn, a well-known German forensic pathologist. The degree of deep bruising and fracturing of the bones in the neck also indicates 
that he was strangled very forcibly. Dr. Thomas is convinced that the prisoner at Spandau was murdered before his release. The purpose to keep him from revealing the treasonous conduct of his secret British contacts during the war. If the prisoner had ever revealed his part in these negotiations, it would have led to the exposure of 30 extremely powerful personages whose relatives are still in control of much of British finance and government. And that would be totally and utterly unacceptable to any British government. If the prisoner at Spandau was Rudolf Hess, as his family and authorities claim, then why were there no scars on his chest from his World War I bullet wounds? Why did his plane take off from Germany with one set of serial numbers and land in Scotland with another? But if the prisoner at Spandau was an imposter, why did he remain silent for 46 years? Prisoner number seven is buried in this small Bavarian cemetery. But who really lies in this grave? Rudolf Hess or an imposter? The inscription on the grave reads simply, it was worth the risk. History may never know what those words really mean. After several years, the British government released a few selections from the official file. But the bulk of the material on the case of Rudolf Hess will remain locked up until the year 2016. Coming up, a high-speed assault leaves one man dead and three others badly injured. Carothersville, Missouri. One October night, Charlie Sigmund showed up at the home of his estranged wife, Anne, and her boyfriend, Gary Goff. According to Anne, Charlie arrived in a drunken rage and forced his way into the house. Once inside, Anne claims that Charlie began to beat her severely. Then Gary Goff came to her rescue. Despite having a broken arm, Gary fought with Charlie and then shot him seven times. Charlie died before police arrived. During questioning by police, Anne and Gary claimed that the shooting was in self-defense. No charges were filed and the two were released. But authorities were still suspicious of Anne Sigmund and Gary Goff. They continued to investigate. Finally, they convinced one of Sigmund's friends to wear a hidden microphone. I will wait until tomorrow, and then I'll call. She, okay. had, uh, in talking with Miss Sigmund, had told her she was fixing to go to the police. Miss Sigmund ultimately told her not to go to the police, or asked her not to go to the police, and give her time to uh, her and uh, Mr. Goff time to leave town. She incriminated herself on the tape. Arrest warrants were issued for both Ann Sigmund and Gary Goff, but the couple had disappeared. Update. After more than two years on the run, Gary Goff turned himself in and pleaded guilty to second degree murder. He was sentenced to 20 years in prison and was released after serving just over 13. But Ann Sigmund has never been caught. There is a warrant out for her arrest for first degree murder. She may be living in Oregon or Arizona under the alias Andy Hayes or Andy Partlow. If you have any information, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Few of us will ever face the terror of being attacked, but it does happen. You're about to meet four young men who felt that terror, and police need your help to find the hit and run killer who assaulted them. Greensburg, North Carolina. 19-year-old Ken Dungy hurried to join three of his best friends to do some last-minute Christmas shopping in Raleigh. It had been a good year for all of them. Hey, man, what's happening? 
The driver, 17-year-old Laverne Allen, had just received a scholarship to the Air Force Academy. It was a dream come true. Ken Dungey was a drafting and engineering student headed for college in the fall. 17-year-old Kenneth Newkirk had just received the scholarship to a local college. And 17-year-old Darius Bannerman was a high school basketball star with a promising future. On their way to the shopping mall, the four passed a car driven by a man named Grady Alexander. When they went by me, they were doing about 60, 65. I looked over, and one of the boys saw me looking at him. He grinned and waved, and the car kept on going. After that, another car came off me very fast. And as he got by me, I happened to look down at the license plate, and I said, a redneck from Georgia, because his hair was looks like it's dirty and greasy and stringy. And he's probably doing 75 or 80. A few moments later. Close, man. It's really close. Can you speed up, man? Can you speed up? When I looked in the rearview mirror, I saw a car. And uh, he was so close to me, I could not see his front bumper. At first, I just thought it was uh, somebody just tailgating. He bumped us, and it didn't seem as though this was all happening. It just seemed, it was like horror. Traffic was moving fast, and we speeded up to get away from the guy. The man driving the Monte Carlo, he had a look like we had done something personal to him, like mad. It just looked like he wanted to hurt us. Minutes later, police and paramedics arrived at the accident site. They found a horrific scene. Laverne Allen was trapped in the car for half an hour. After being airlifted to a trauma center, his leg was amputated at the thigh. Ken Newkirk had suffered a fractured skull and a broken leg. Tell me your name. What's your name? Darius Bannerman had a broken wrist and facial injuries. Ken Dungey was pronounced dead at the scene. Beth Veliket was the first reporter to arrive. She spoke with witnesses who described the assault. Both of the eyewitnesses said that after the car, black car went off the road, the Monte Carlo did pull over to the side. Come on! A man and a woman got out just for a moment and looked back, and then they just got back in the car and drove off. I swear he laughed when he got in the car and left. I, thought... I swear he did. Georgia plates, Georgia plates. We asked an artist to sketch a composite of the hit and run driver based on eyewitness testimony. The man had a mustache and brown stringy hair. He was traveling with a woman who had blonde hair. I know how it happened, I know when it happened, but I don't know why it happened. Until I understand that, it will never be too bad. If you have any information about this case, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, a gravely ill child makes a sudden recovery under some very mysterious circumstances. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. 
Nancy and Chuck McGivern respond to their oldest son's calls for help. Their seven-year-old son, Chucky, has been in bed with chickenpox. To their horror, he has slipped into a coma. Honey, he is ice cold. They rush him to a hospital. Doctors work to stabilize him, only to discover that his brain is dangerously swollen. The doctor warned me when I went in there. He says, when you see him, he's going to look like he's dead. His skin was so hard and cold and pure white. And just his liver, everything was just hooked up to everything. And I was shocked. I was really shocked. Chucky's diagnosis was grim. He had Rye's syndrome, a rare disease of the nervous system, brain, and liver that is often fatal. Nancy and Chuck were soon joined by other family members, some of whom brought religious medals for comfort and healing. Nancy's cousin gave her a medallion from the robe of St. John Newman, the patron saint of vocations. Remember when I was in that car crash in Italy? This was in my pocket, and I swear it saved my life. John Newman was a beloved Catholic priest and the bishop of Philadelphia in the mid-19th century. After his death, people began praying to him for blessings, and many healing miracles were attributed to him. So many that in 1977, John Newman was declared the first American male saint. Nancy was willing to try anything to save her son, she pinned several medals, including the one showing John Newman to Chucky's pillow. But Chucky didn't improve. After a day or two, like, his lungs collapsed. Pneumonia set in, and there was two nurses, and they didn't know I was there. In the room, they were behind this, this door there, and when I came in, I heard them say, he's not going to make it. Chucky's parents could do nothing but hope. And then the next morning, Chucky's father had an odd encounter in the hospital waiting room. It was like 11 o'clock or something like that. And I was uh, watching TV, and uh, all of a sudden this little boy walks in. He looks at everybody in the room, and he looks, stares at me. I'm staring at him thinking, you know, I mean, his parents are gonna come in next. And I'm wondering why, like, why is he by himself? And he just walked out. So later that day, the nurse comes up and says, so he had a little incident. We don't want you to get worried, but uh, a little boy came to visit Chucky. I came to see Chucky. How did you get in here? I only wanted to see Chucky. Wait, wait, come back here. Wait, wait a second. Excuse me, doctor. Less than an hour later, the impossible happened. Chucky? Chucky? To his parents, it was a miracle. Within hours, Chucky would be awake and off life support. Chucky. From being very low, where you think, well, my son might die, to he came through it, it was, oh my, it was like great. I mean, every, we were calling everybody on the phone that he was getting better, and, and you know, but he got better so fast, it was unbelievable. There you go, Chucky. Chucky began telling his parents about a dream he had while unconscious. He described the same boy that his father and his doctor had seen in the hospital. I remember when I got up, I was sort of confused because I didn't understand if I, that, that was all a dream or did, did that actually happen. Well, there were lots of kids in the room giving me presents, and you and Dad were here too. And all these Asian kids would surround me, coming in and out, giving me presents of all sorts. But there was one boy in particular who was uh, stayed by my bedside. Things be all right. This boy in my dream was uh, my best friend, and uh, um, 
he, he, he was like the strength for me and at all times when I wasn't feeling like in the stream, when I wasn't maybe not feeling so good, he was there to make sure everything was all right. One week after he had lapsed into a coma, Chucky McGivern was released from the hospital. The doctor said they never had anybody so gravely ill recover so fast. And three months later, we went back, and they went through everything, and he came out like he was never sick, is what the doctor said, like nothing ever happened to him. St. John Newman. Two weeks after Chucky left the hospital, his parents took him to the shrine of St. John Newman in Philadelphia. Of St. John Newman, when he died as Bishop of Philadelphia in 1860. What is it, honey? That was my best friend in my dream in the hospital. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Watch him. The McGiverns were amazed when they realized that the portrait was of St. John Newman as a boy. I was so taken back. I then I started thinking, it really hit me that something happened here, that St. John Newman interceded for him in some way. There was some kind of a connection there. It's hard to believe, and I don't know why. He's just like any other kid at his age. But there must be a reason for it, I don't know. The reason why St. John Newman came to my aid, I have no idea. Um, that's something I'll never, never be able to explain. But I, I know like St. John will always like be there for me, which is always good. You know, I know he'll always be like near my side.